welcome everybody for another installment of the Options Industry Council's webinar series. Thanks for joining us today. So we've got an awful lot to offer, so hopefully you can find value from today's presentation and continue moving forward with our series. As we stick with the first quarter, our overreaching theme is using options to manage risk and to hedge a position, and we'll get to some really good strategies in February and March Laying the foundation here in January, my name is Ed Modla. I manage the OCC Investor Services team, and I'm an instructor here at OCC, or OIC. I started my career in the late 90s on the trading floor in Chicago at the SIBO and Mercantile Exchange, traded for a little while in New York as well, uh, moved into the electronic environment at the turn of the century and spent many years trading options, futures, and stock um, in that environment before getting into the brokerage and, and client service side in the futures markets and then joining up with the OIC team here just over four years ago. So today we'll be talking options pricing factors. I think there's going to be a little bit for everybody in this presentation today. We'll get into some theta and vega talk. We'll get into some simple strategies, the outright positions. So for you, for you attendees who are new, uh, there certainly is a lot to cover, and we should have some good, valuable information for you. For those of you a little more seasoned who might be more at the intermediate or advanced level, I think I'll have some commentary and insight along the way that will be beneficial to you as well. OIC provides free, unbiased education on options. That's what we do pr predominantly through our website at optionseducation.org. We have many webinars throughout the year, videos, podcasts online, many tools and resources. We'll go through a few of those today. And the Investor Services Desk, the team that I manage, can be reached at options at the OCC.com. You can send any options-related email questions to that email, and we'll do our best to help you out. OIC's efforts are funded by the Options Clearing Corporation. OCC is the risk manager of the industry, the backbone of the industry, clearing options as they're executed at the exchange level and managing risk across the industry. The options industry could not function without uh, the clearing function that OCC provides. And the industry has been thriving. We saw a great uptick in volume at the turn of the century, certainly electronic trading and the speed and access to which investors had to options increased at that time, also education and awareness. Uh, there was at some point in the 90s uh, a dawning of do-it-yourself investing, and that took a stranglehold on the industry, and, and, and investors learn more about options, and they manage their own money and put pressure on their advisors to manage it more intensely. Options became more and more popular, and you see that exponential growth that we've seen in the industry. 2011 had a spike, if those of you uh, were trading back then, you remember the uh, European sovereign debt crisis, high volatility in the markets for that entire year, um, then volatility tapered off until last year. Um, many of you are probably very familiar with the uncertainty and volatility that we saw in 2018. Got over 5 billion total contracts. You see equity versus non-equity, most of that trading in the equity markets, but over 5 billion contracts for the first time ever. The industry is certainly thriving, and here are the exchanges where all of that activity takes place. This is where your orders are routed when you make um, your orders through your brokerage firm. Uh, these are also the entities that decide which equities will get listed options and what strike prices and expiration dates are available to trade. Each of these exchanges makes independent decisions. They have rules that guide uh, listing procedures, uh, also bid-ask spreads, and the activity, the actual activity on their exchanges. Um, that includes executed transactions, pricing, uh, the width of the bid asks. They have rules set in place and they govern and oversee the activity that occurs on their exchanges. Here's our presentation outline for today. A few comments on pricing basics from an overview perspective. Then I'm going to spend some time digging a little bit deep into the concepts of time decay and implied volatility. We'll move on towards the end. The last segment will break out the outright options positions. The entire universe of options strategies will come from these four sides, buying calls, buying puts, selling calls, selling puts. We'll overview those as we get into February and March and discuss more complex strategies. You certainly have to understand these four outright before you can understand anything more complex. Q&A will be 
conducted along the way. Mark Benzaquin of the Investor Services team is behind the scenes as we speak, answering your questions as they're coming in. So he will be uh, answering those live, uh, time permitting. We'll see if we get to questions at the end. And please take our survey that's attached to this presentation. I'm not allowed to make too many guarantees, but one guarantee I can make is we do read every single comment that is sent to us through those surveys. You help shape our program. So please take that survey and send us your feedback. First question we're going to start with today is, where do option prices come from? Who makes these options prices? Uh, it's not uncommon for me to get questions at my desk from investors and trading firms who think the prices they're seeing are unfair. And usually that be, is a result of a formula they've used to derive a price that they think is more fair. Or if they are a call buyer and the market has rallied, they think the option should be trading higher than it actually is. Conversely, if they bought puts and the market trades lower, they think the options should be trading higher. But whenever you can, whenever you analyze or run through option prices in a calculator, all you're going to get is a theoretical value. Ultimately, the prices in the open market will be determined by all market participants. That's you, me, and everybody else who is willing to put a bid or an offer out there on a particular option. The best bid ask is the culmination or the consensus of all of those bids and offers that come from every single market participant. It wasn't too long ago where I did speak with an investor who had a long put option. The stock uh, consequently or subsequently sold off significantly, and his put option was not increasing in value very much. We'll get into some of how and why that can happen later, but um, as he was frustrated thinking the option needs to be trading higher because the stock just sold off and I own a put option, well, ultimately the answer comes down to there are more sellers now. There are people willing to sell this option at lower and lower levels, and you might not be happy with it. You might think those levels are too low, but if bids and offers are going to match up, that is the fair level for the market. Similar to stocks, the stock market, a particular stock, is always trying to find that fair level. If there's a lot of buyers, the price goes up. If there's a lot of sellers, the price goes down. The market's trying to find an equilibrium where there's no trading, and that's where it settles. Options are no different. A lot of buyers will increase prices. Sellers decreases them, and the market finds that happy medium. Having said all that, option pricing models are worthwhile. They help guide you and determine whether you have an opinion that the market might be overpricing or underpricing options. You know supply and demand is going to ultimately override those theoretical values, but certainly doing analysis and homework is very important. And we're going to start this with one of our tools. This is on the Options Industry Council website, a section near the bottom, Options Quotes and Calculators. You'll find this. We'll walk through it here today. You can type in a symbol at the top, Select the style of option that you're looking at. That would be American or European for American options. Those are equity and ETF options. The price of the stock. Now, if you've selected a symbol up top, it'll do this for you. You hit go, and it'll fill in, pre-populate most of these categories. Stock price, strike price, the expiration date. Days to expiration will all automatically fill in. Volatility, we'll leave that alone for just a second. Interest rates will pre-populate. The interest rate you're looking for here is the risk-free interest rate between today and the expiration date of the option. And, and the reason why that's important in an option pricing model is if you're buying calls, for example, you're spending a lot less money than you would be spending if you bought the stock outright. You're saving that capital, which you then can invest in theory at the risk-free rate. So that rate and the return you can get on the capital you're saving by buying an option is going to factor into that pricing. So the risk-free rate is a known number. You can look it up and use the rate that you see best fit. Dividends and the dividend amount is also a known number that will pre-populate as well. Now let's go back up to volatility. In this example, you see volatility 20%. This is what is known as the, the driving force of the option price. It's the unknown element. We will get, we'll get into a deeper discussion about volatility and implied volatility rates a little bit later in the presentation, but this number is changeable. This is what the market is constantly trying to determine. What is the fair level 
of volatility to be used today, and it's always changing. Once you have all of those inputs on the left side, hit calculate, and you will get the outputs on the right side, the call price, the put price, and then all the Greeks. The Greeks, uh, we certainly could define as, as a topic for a different presentation, but a lot of outputs can be derived using this calculator. I'll also point out what's there on the right side at the bottom. If you wanted to start with the option price, you can select using the drop down, the call, or the put option, input the price of the option, hit calculate, and that section of the calculator would tell you what volatility rate it would require to get that option price doing the calculation backwards. It's a really helpful, useful tool on our website. I encourage you to use it, play around with it. If you have questions or you're uncertain about how to read some things, reach out to the team. Reach out to Investor Services. We'll be glad to help you out. The premium amount, of course, comes from the buyers and the sellers. The option buyer pays premium upfront, non-refundable, to the option seller who receives that capital, that premium amount, upfront. Now there's an open position. The buyer has rights. The seller has obligations. Often, buyers and sellers trade back the contract to close. They often can and do. That means if you opened a position as a buyer, you sold it to close before it reached expiration. In fact, this brings up one of the myths in this industry, which is that most options contracts expire worthless. It's not uncommon for me to hear that argument be made, but it is a myth. It's not true. OCC statistics have shown um, consistently that year in, year out, about 70% of all options are in fact closed before they ever reach expiration date. Of those options that are still open and reach expiration, uh, the vast majority of those expire worthless and unexercised. But that makes sense. That is actually common sense. If you're an option holder, you purchase an option to, op to open, and there is value to extract from it, you have to sell that back and close it before expiration in order to avoid exercise, if that's what you intend to do, and a lot of investors do. If you hold it through expiration with value, you're either going to go exercise it or it doesn't have any value left and it just disappears. So it makes sense that the statistics work out that way and the myth that most options expire worthless just simply isn't true. So let's get into premium and then break it up. Uh, our example here is going to be of an option that is quoted for $3. If we buy or sell this option, a total of $300 changes hands. And we want to break that number up into pieces to understand it better, and then we'll explain why understanding it in pieces is useful to us. In a very simple form, an option premium can be thought of as two pieces, the intrinsic value and the time value. Remember what in the money is, that key term that we discussed last week. In the money is an option for call options that has a strike price below where the stock is, and for put options, strike price is higher. The way I describe that is if the option holder owns the right to execute a stock transaction at a more favorable price than the open market, it's in the money. If I own the $50 call and the stock's trading at 55 I own the right to buy it better than the open market. It's in the money. And that particular option is in the money by $5. Intrinsic value is the in the money amount. It is that simple and can be precisely calculated. First question you ask yourself is, is it in the money? If it's not, the intrinsic value is zero. If it is, how much is it in the money? And that is your intrinsic value. Time value is all of the premium above and beyond that in excess of the intrinsic value. And this is the component that decays with each passing day as expiration approaches. It accounts for the possibility that the stock will move and the value of the option will change. Specifically, it will change and increase in value. It, it accommodates for that possibility and pays the seller for taking on risk that their investment will increase in value. At expiration, time value has become zero. There's nothing left. So the only premium remaining in an option once we've reached the point of expiration is intrinsic value. There's no time left. 
So intrinsic value is all there is, if any. If the option isn't in the money at expiration, it doesn't have any value. Let's put this in a graphical form. The large triangle re represents the total amount of option premium. We can break that up into two sides. Intrinsic value, again, can be calculated very simply by analyzing the stock price versus the strike price. The first question, is it in the money? If it is, by how much? If it's not in the money, then the intrinsic value is zero. That can be backed out very easily. On the other side, we have time value, which is more complex. What are the components of time value? We defined it very simply on the previous slide, but the components of time value are many. Time is how many, how many days are there left till expiration? We know that number. Volatility, as I said before, is the unknown number the market is constantly trying to find. Risk-free interest rates, whether or not the stock pays dividends, those are also known numbers. So time value is a little more complex, has different pieces to it. And all of these pieces can work with each other in the same direction or have an influence on the option price in the same direction or in opposite directions, and you need to be aware of that as well. Another way to look at this, in the money calls and puts, they have intrinsic value simply because they're in the money, and they also have time value. We say may have time value, but they do, even if it's very small. They have time value. They have both, intrinsic and time. At the money and out of the money calls, they're not in the money at all, so they have no intrinsic value. Their entire premium amount is time value. And briefly, the reason why this is important is when you look at an option premium in the open market, you will want to know what portion is intrinsic and what portion is time. Intrinsic value doesn't decay, but its value is affected by the stock price movement. Time value decays. It's affected by the passage of time the movement of volatility, or the change in interest rates or dividends. So intrinsic value you know is only sensitive to one thing, and you can clearly observe what price that is and the direction it's moving. You may have an opinion on what direction the stock is moving, which will affect the intrinsic value. Having an opinion on volatility or a change in interest rates or dividends is more difficult to do, but that is the component that will make up time value at the money and out of the money options, entirely 100% time value. That will decay. If it gets intrinsic value, it will only be if the stock moves enough to place those options in the money. Let's look at a few examples. We have a stock trading at $53 a share. Let's look at the January 50 call trading in the open market for $5.20. This call option is in the money. The owner of the call has the right to buy shares at 50 that is more favorable than 53, so it is in the money by an amount of $3. What's left of the 520 minus 3 is 220. So you can break this up into pieces. I know now that the intrinsic value of $3 is going to be affected by the stock moving. Time value is going to be affected by the number of factors we discussed earlier, which includes simply the passage of time. Another example, 55 strike call option, trading at 210. Is this in the money or not? Call option holder owns the right to pay $55. That's worse than our current open market price of 53, so it's not in the money at all. It's out of the money. The intrinsic value here is going to be zero, the time value is the entire amount of 210. You can see the difference between these two options here. The 55 call certainly trades for less than half the price of the 50 call option, but it also needs movement. There's no intrinsic value yet. If we're going to make money on this trade, the stock's going to have to move. So we can spend less, but we also are a little more aggressive in the stock price movement that we will need to be profitable. That's the difference between these two options. Let's take a quiz. Here you have stock prices on the left, followed by the option that we're looking at, the strike price, whether it's a call or put, the option premium amount. What we ultimately want to determine is 
how much time value is there in each of these options? Is it in the money, at the money, or out of the money? And then back out, intrinsic versus time, and see what the time value is. First option, 70 strike price call option, the owner, the holder, owns the right to pay $70 a share. That's better than 77. That's an in the money option. In the money, buy an amount of $7, so the remaining value is $350. If this stock price does not move all the way through expiration, the intrinsic value of $7 is going to stay exactly at $7 and not move, while the time value of $350 is going to decay all the way down to zero. Next option is a 60 put. If you own the 60 put, you have the right to sell shares at 60. That's better than 58 half. That's an in the money option. Buy $1.50. The remaining amount is time value of $225. And the last two I'll put up quickly. If you own the 85 call, that's worse than 83. That's out of the money. No intrinsic value. All of that option premium, $225, is considered time value. And same thing for the last one. It's an at the money option. It's not in the money at all. So the intrinsic is, vet, is zero and the time value is $1.50. Well, I want to dig a little bit deeper into the concept of time decay and theta as a number. Theta represents sensitivity to time, specifically with the passage of one day. If you're looking up this number on your platform, you'll likely see it expressed in a similar form that you see here as a negative number, and it represents the option premium amount that is expected to decrease with the passage of one day. Please note that theta, like all other Greeks, is an inexact science and might be wrong and will be wrong at times. So you have to take it for what it's worth. With all other pricing factors remaining constant, this is in theory how much the option will lose value. First of all, the situation where all other pricing factors remain constant is rare to find, but if that's the case, then you would see, in theory, this amount decrease. On their own, calls and puts have negative theta amounts. Uh, I'm going to distinguish that from open positions, which is a bit different. Long options have negative thetas. Short options have positive thetas. If you purchase options, theta is working against you. That negative decay from one day to the next is hurting your P&L, so you have negative effect or a negative theta position. If you are a seller of options, that decay is working in your favor. So your theta is actually positive as a position. As an option themselves, theta is negative because it decreases their, their open market value. But again, as positions, a short position would actually be positive theta. We said that decay is represented on a per calendar day. That's not per trading day. And it decays as you go through expiration. When we get expiration, the only thing left is intrinsic value. Now, if you're thinking, since it's a calendar day, that when you have weekends and holidays, there's a multitude of days coming out all at once. That's true. From Friday until Monday, there are three days of theta that are removed from the premium of the option. But it's not as simple as being able to sell options on Friday afternoon and wake up on Monday and have a profit. First of all, we already said other pricing factors play a major role. But even regardless of that, the market doesn't give away things for free. And this reminds me of being uh, on the trading floor working for professional trading firms uh, some years back. Of course, when you come into Friday afternoon, even Friday morning, sometimes even Thursday afternoon, you sometimes begin to expect sellers to come in because there's a long weekend coming up. And professionals will proactively preempt that by lowering their values or taking out the three days before they ever happen. It was common practice at the firms I was with um, by the time we reached lunch on Friday to go into our algorithms and our, our calculations and change the days to expiration to reflect Monday. So when I was trading going into the closing bell on Friday afternoon, the values I was looking at actually represented what I expected to see on Monday morning. 
had already taken the weekend out. That's common practice. You see that a lot in this industry. So it's not as easy as selling right before the weekend week closes, thinking you're going to get a quick three days. It doesn't work quite that easy. But it's important to know that when you see a theta number, it does re represent the calendar days to expiration. Now, how do these how does theta behave as you move towards expiration? That is a very interesting topic to discuss. And a very simple graph to represent that is here. Theta doesn't move in a constant way. And the moneyness of the option also plays a role. By moneyness, I mean at the money, in the money, or out of the money. We didn't complicate this graph with out of the money options, but we could have. Each of them behave a bit differently. What you'll first notice on the left is at the money options have more time value to begin with. There's a lot more uncertainty around at the money options, whether or not they're going to finish in or out of the money and by how much. So there is more time value for at the money options and they lose their time value more slowly. That tipping point right where the arrow is up there where it says at the money option generally understood to be around that 40 to 45 day level where at the money options start to see an increase in the amount of time value that is removed from the premium. In the money options behave a bit differently. Out of the money options also behave a little bit differently. One interesting note there, if you think about out of the money options, at some point, options are reduced to a value where it's not worth selling. If you think back to options 101, selling when you sell an option, all you can make from selling an option is the premium received. And when you get an option premium down to levels, a nickel or a dime or such, at some point, it's not worth taking on the risk to sell them. So as a mathematical model might tell you that theta should be moving the price lower and lower and lower, that might not actually be the case because at some point, those far out of the money puts just don't go any lower. No one wants to sell them, so they hold their value. The way they hold their value really is from supply and demand, but then mathematically, that train translates into increased implied volatility. And think about that for a second. Days are being removed. Theta is having an effect, but the premium doesn't change. The only thing that can therefore change and result in those prices not moving is implied volatility going up. And you do see that in this industry. Key takeaway here, especially for the beginners, is that when you see graphs on theta and time decay, most commonly you're seeing the at the money graph because it really represents theta over time and the change at that 40 to 45 day level where theta accelerates in the money options and out of the money options do behave differently and they can, especially at the tails, hold their value when mathematical models would tell you otherwise. This would leave a more simplistic analysis with the conclusion that those deep out of the money options are priced too high. And if you continue to sell those, well, eventually that's when you can get yourself into trouble. Is it worth selling cheap, cheap options, even if I think their implied volatility levels are too high when all that can make is the premium? You'll see this graph again, and it'll come up in a lot of your education as we go through, but we're gonna, we're gonna show this dynamic a bit differently on a graph here. And I'm not going to walk through the numbers. I just want to really have you observe two things. On the left side, as you go down, you'll see the days to expiration getting closer and closer and the theta increasing. This is one particular option. The stock XYZ is at 50, and we're looking at an at-the-money call with a 20% implied volatility level. As the days to expiration approaches, the theta continues to increase and the option premium continues to decrease. Compare this with the left side now. The second observation is comparing the two. We still have the 50 strike call. That's still at the money. The top row, 365 days to expiration. But look what we did on the right side. Implied volatility is doubled. Option premium amounts are higher and raw absolute theta numbers are also higher. That's the effect of implied volatility. If those levels are higher, here it's 40% versus 20. 
What that means is that extrinsic value, otherwise known as time value, itself is much higher than the 20% number. If the extrinsic value is higher then the theta amounts or each day's decay is also going to be higher. And you see how that plays out here. Increasing vol by a significant amount yields higher option premium amounts, and that will translate into higher theta amounts. Let's shift gears and discuss implied volatility. First of all, there are there are several types, and we'll discuss a few of them here. Historical volatility is the price movement of the stock in the past. You can measure this. You can look back and get raw data and calculate exactly what the stock has done in the past and what volatility levels are attached to those stock price movements. Implied volatility implies what the market price of an option is. It is the volatility that is justified by the option price. It's a future forecast of what the volatility of the stock price might be between today and expiration. There really is a third type. I might be stretching to say that, but historic implied volatility I will define as an historic analysis of what implied volatilities have been in the past. Many investors will use all three of those in their analysis. One important question to ask is, are implied volatility levels going to gravitate towards the historical volatility levels? They may or may not. You might observe that implied volatility levels for a particular stock or ETF are consistently and always higher than the historical volatility levels of that stock or ETF. You can get to that analysis by looking at historical implied volatility levels. When you're analyzing volatility, a common question comes up is how do I know whether it's too high or too low? And the question you're asking yourself not is where is implied versus historical or where is implied versus historical implied itself. The question you're trying to answer is, is current levels or are current levels of implied volatility going to gravitate to the mean of either one of those previous two? If implied volatility is 40% and I know historic volatility is 35, does that mean that options are too expensive? It may or may not. Implied volatility might gravitate down towards 35, but there also might be a very good reason why they're 40% and not 35. There's no rule that states that implied couldn't go even higher. Investors need to be aware of that. Same thing goes for an analysis of current implied versus historic implied. If you observe that historically, implied volatility levels are lower than they are today, the question to ask is, Will current levels gravitate towards that long-term average or not? What information do I need to gather about the market, about the economy, about this particular stock? What do I need to do to analyze whether I think implied volatility levels are justified or not? This analysis of these three pieces can go a long way, but it is an inexact science. The market is constantly trying to determine where fair levels of volatility are, and they are constantly changing. Only options have implied volatility, and the options market is trying to find or determine in the future what levels of stock volatility might we see. And as it's determining that level, it is extracting an option price. That is the level that you are inputting in the options calculators that I discussed in the beginning. Where do you think options implied volatility should be? And what then would be a fair price for the call and the put options that we see on the board? You can then determine whether you have an opinion on implied volatility being too high or too low. We've got a really slick tool on the website, same section as I referenced earlier, the options quotes and calculators section of the website, drop down the menu when you go there and scroll to the bottom, you will find this tool, uh, which allows you to look at 
historic and implied volatility levels going back one week ago, one month ago. You can see where they were, where they are today, and where they've been. And then you can determine for yourselves what type of analysis do you need to do and how can you determine if current levels should go back to where they were or not. And then that might help you make a trading decision. Now let's break up the four outright options positions that you can do. As I said earlier, uh, there's a lot of complex strategies and we're going to get into many of them in the remaining sessions for our, our first quarter a webinar series, but all of them come from the four basic positions of buying calls and puts and selling calls and puts. You have to understand them outright before you can put them together into spreads or use them as outright trades. Buying call options is bullish. The investor is trying to capitalize on rising prices, their influence to buy calls rather than buying stock is to spend less money and to have limited defined risk. This is a way to capitalize on a bullish market, on a stock moving higher, without having to buy shares. Ultimately, the call buyer would like to see that movement in the stock have a positive influence on the call option that they purchase so they can sell it for a profit without ever having to buy shares. Keep in mind one thing I mentioned earlier, there are different forces that affect an option premium amount. The stock moving is one of them. If I buy a call option and the stock moves higher, I know that the intrinsic value of the option is going to be influenced in a positive way. It will increase. However, the time value portion may or may not work in my favor. The classic example here is when earnings are announced. It is not uncommon to hear from an investor who thinks earnings will be positive, stock's gonna rally, so they buy call options without considering how much intrinsic value they've just paid for and how much time value they've just paid for. They just simply buy the option for what, it's caught, for what it costs in the open market. After earnings, the stock may be up one, one and a half, two percent. Say it has a mild move higher. Investors, knee-jerk reaction is to think the stock moved up, the option must have moved up. But that doesn't always happen. The positive influence of the stock moving higher improved intrinsic value, but the release of the earnings announcement creates a lot less uncertainty about the near-term future of stock prices, so implied volatility levels may have come down dramatically. Those two forces work against each other. The increase or positive value I observe in intrinsic value could be more than offset by the negative effect of time value, specifically with volatility dropping and one day passing. Not uncommon to see that, and if you don't understand that dynamic, then you won't understand how your option price has moved. Now, it's certainly possible to buy calls prior to earnings. I don't want to advocate against that, but you have to be aware of how much time value am I paying? What are implied volatility levels here when I'm purchasing this option? And no, you likely need a, a move in the stock larger or more magnified than the market is predicting. Not just a move in your direction, but something significant in order to capitalize on those types of trades. And leverage, of course. We're spending a relatively small amount of money to control 100 shares. That is a very big motivation to buy call options. Let's walk through an example. Stock is trading at $60 a share. We're bullish. We want to limit our downside risk. We don't want to buy shares, so we go to the options market. We look out three months and buy the 60 strike call option for $3, paying a total of $300, and here is how that looks as we plot and graph at expiration values. I wanna point one thing out. When you see these types of, of charts and the P&L graph will put up on the next slide, the only way to precisely calculate these charts is by looking at the expiration time frame. 
because that is when we know time value will be zero and intrinsic value can be calculated and precisely forecasted based on various stock price levels. Prior to expiration, we don't know what volatility levels will be. Will be. We don't know what time value will be. So we can't make these calculations and come up to these profit and loss numbers in any precise way before expiration. You can predict. Using the option calculator, if you want to forecast a stock price moving to 70 in two weeks, so still having two and a half months till expiration, you can use a calculator to estimate what you think the option might be worth at that time and estimate a possible profit that you would have. But graphs like this can only really be done with clean math at expiration, and that's what we've done here. Notice on the, the value of the long 60 call option, when we get 60 and below, it doesn't have any value. It's at the money and then it's out of the money. As you move higher, we increase in value. $5 in the money, it's worth $500. $10 in the money, it's worth 1000 The cost of 300 that's a sunk cost up front. That cash came right out of our account as soon as we bought the option. So you'll notice on the right, the net P&L difference here, the benefit we get is the downside. We didn't have to buy shares, so if the stock tanks and heads lower to 50 or beyond, below that, 40, 30, doesn't matter how low it goes, we can only lose $300. On the upside, we do need a larger move to make money. At expiration, if the stock moves up to 63, we break even. That's a 5% move in the direction we thought it was going to move and we wouldn't make any money in this case. We need the stock to go above $63. That would be our break-even point. Up to 70, stock's worth, uh, their option is worth $10, and profit is 700 On the graph, this is how it looks. The break-even point is calculated by taking the strike price of the option, adding the call premium to it, and getting 63 We need the option to pay us back the $3 we paid up front. That will happen at expiration if it is $3 in the money. And in this case, that puts the stock at 63 Max loss on the downside is fixed. We know exactly what that's going to be, and that's going to be our total premium of 300 Buying put options. Why would you buy a put options? In this case, the investor will be bearish on the stock or ETF and looking, or looking to hedge a position. That would be your classic form of buying protective puts. As an outright position, a put owner owns the right to sell shares at the strike price. As the stock drops to lower and lower levels, the right to sell shares at that fixed price continues to increase in value and look better and better. So that's why put values increase as the stock price drops. For those who are beginners, this could sound backwards. It might take a little time to wrap this concept around your head clearly. The more times you hear it, the more times you think about it, it does make sense. This is taking a short position in the market, even though you're buying something and going along the investment itself. We're going along the puts, but short the market. The investor is looking to benefit from falling prices. We're going to spend less money than we would, we would have to if we, for example, shorted the stock and had to put up margin, looking to capitalize on the, on the stock price, moving lower. Selling stocks short may be something we never want to do or even have a right to do in our account, and we pay premium up front. We know what that sunk cost is going to be. We know what the option premium amount is going to cost us, and now we have a bearish position. Example, stock XYZ is trading at 36 we're bearish on the stock. We want upside our upside risk, if we're wrong, to be limited. So we use the options market to try and capitalize here. We buy a three-month 35-strike put for $2.25. That translates into a total cost of $225, and this is what it looks like at expiration. $32.75 is the break-even. Hope you can see that. The 35 put option gives the put buyer the right to sell shares at 35. In order to break even, 
I need to be able to do that $2.25 better than the open market. If I can do that, I will pay myself back for the premium amount that I paid up front. 35 minus 225 gets me 3275 and you can see that's highlighted in red on the bottom the value of the put has offset the cost of the put and there is my break even point now this is a 3 month option so I'll say it again here if the stock drops from 35 down to 3275 tomorrow you are likely going to be in a position to make a profit here. This is at expiration where the stock prices need to be to profit and where they would need to be for you to be out of the money. Prior to expiration, a whole lot of different things can happen, and you can use options calculators to estimate and predict where you think the value of the put option will be with the stock price at a certain level with a certain number of days left until expiration. On a graph, we have the 35 put. Above 35, the option isn't worth anything, so we lose our entire premium of 225. As the stock drops, we start to increase in value. So to the left, we can see the, sh the, the slope of this graph looks exactly the same as if we shorted the stock. The difference is the premium. The put option will always perform $2.25 worse than the short stock position will to the downside. It'll profit but by that amount less because that's what we paid up front. Break-even point, strike price minus what we paid up front. That's going to give us 32.75. At that level, the put option has paid us back the premium that we spent up front. Maximum loss is fixed. This is why one of the big reasons why we did this trade in the first place. We can only lose what, what we put into it, the maximum loss, 225 or $2 uh, $225 total. Let's flip to the other side, selling calls and puts. We'll break these out into individual trades and discuss briefly why you would do these trades. As an isolated uh, execution, this is bearish. Selling calls obligates the writer to deliver shares at a certain price. There's no other position on, and this is not a spread of any kind. This would be a bearish outlook. We don't want the stock to go higher above where we're obligated to sell it. So we're bearish. We think prices are going to stagnate, consolidate, or move lower. And when, when you look through the motivations for doing this trade, you know, certainly selling calls is a viable outright trade. It's arguably the highest risk options trade you can do. Um, but understanding how to sell calls is very critical. You'll see when we go through uh, vertical spreads and covered calls, um, just how important understanding this strategy is and how much it can benefit you when used in conjunction with other trades. But you do have to start at that ground floor and understand what it means to sell it outright. And here we do have an example selling the 60 strike call option at $3. The most we can make when we sell an option is what we receive. The value cannot go below zero. So the most we can make is $3. That will happen if the option finishes out of the money. In this case, that's below $60. As the stock starts to rally, we start to see our option increase in value. And we are technically short shares up here. So we will lose as the option goes further and further in the money unlimited. Now, if you, you see cover call reference on the bottom, it, if you own shares, the dynamics of this trade change completely. And instead of having unlimited risk, you are then left with uh, one of the more conservative options trades. And we'll get to a little more of that in a second, but let's finish up the calculations. Break even point, strike price plus $3, that's 63. If the option rally, if the stock rallied up to 63, the option would be worth $3. We sold it, so we would have to actually give back the $3 that we received up front to close that position and buy it back. That's our break-even point at 63. Maximum profit is the $300 we received. Now, if we already own the shares, let's say we own them from somewhere below the strike price of 60, all we're doing now 
is changing our obligation to delivering the shares that we already own. And when compared to selling calls outright, which has unlimited risk, the covered call has a very different risk profile. And we have plenty of material that we're going to get through on that particular strategy, but it is certainly worth noting uh, that the short call outright, while it's essential to understand it, um, is not used very frequently by investors, while the covered call is on the complete opposite end of that spectrum and is used very frequently. Selling puts. Why would you sell a put? Remember, selling puts puts us under the obligation to purchase shares. If those shares go lower and lower and lower, then our obligation to buy those shares looks worse. But we don't want that to happen. We would like the stock to remain above the strike price. And that would be bullish. The stock moves further and further away from the strike price that we sold, the value of the option will decrease and we will profit that way. Also, we might be looking to buy shares. And in this case, selling put options will obligate us to possibly buy shares at a strike price where we actually want to buy them. You could think of this as a way to generate income and work a limit order to try and buy shares. Now, I'm going to say this doesn't work exactly like a limit order. Let's walk through that. If you sell a put option, you're obligated to buy shares at the strike price. Let's say that strike price is 60. And we want to buy shares there. And we can receive premium up front. So we're thinking, why not just sell the put option, receive premium in our account, generate some additional income. And if I'm assigned and buying shares at 60, I want to buy them anyway. And I'm going to get paid to work that order. And if the stock doesn't go to 60 and it stays above there and trades in the mid-60s or high 60s or above, then I'll just make the option premium. Sounds fantastic. And it is a popular trade, very worth, uh, worthwhile considering and understanding how that trade works. It's very popular. The one difference I want to point out that's important for you to understand is how it doesn't work like a limit order. Options are most likely going to be assigned at expiration. If you sold the 60 strike put option and the stock dropped down to 55 prior to expiration, a pretty good chance you will not be assigned. Why would the put option holder exercise early if they don't have to? They won't have to take more risk if they exercise early. If they want to close out the position today, they probably can sell the option for more money than they can extract by exercising it. Those are the reasons why pretty good chance you won't be assigned. If you worked a limit order on the stock at the price of 60 and the stock dropped down to 55, you'd be filled. You would have your shares. So now what happens if the stock does turn around? You wanted shares there. They, they went down to 55. Now they've turned around. They've gone up through 60, and they take off, and they're up into the high 60s and up into the 70 level. If you worked a straight-out limit order on the stock, you'd have the shares, and you would capitalize on that move. If you sold a put option and you didn't get assigned, you never got the shares, stock took off, you didn't capitalize. You'd still make the option premium. That's still in your account up front. That wouldn't change but you wouldn't have capitalized on the big move in the stock as it moved higher. It's important to understand that difference if you're using puts, short puts, as a way to purchase stock. It's a very solid strategy, like I said, very popular and widely used by investors, but understand that difference and understand how assignment works so you don't get surprised by anything. Here's our example, uh, cash-secured put. Stock's trading at 50 we sell a 45 strike put option for $2. Our max profit on this trade by itself is just the $2 that we received up front. If the stock rallies, we make $2. Max loss is substantial because we might actually have to go in and buy those shares at 45. But keep this in mind. You see that third point there, break even, strike price minus premium. If we're assigned on this option and we're paying $45 for shares, we actually were paid $2 up front. That will improve our cost basis, and we will now be long the shares from 43 You can probably see, uh, just looking at this graph, the, uh, 
the absolute perfect situation for you, if you want to own the shares, would be for the stock to drop down to about 44, get assigned there. Now you're long the shares and you're long from 43. If something that ideal happened, uh, then you would actually be able to put in a stop loss immediately at your break-even point if you wanted to, uh, which is not a bad place to be. That's that's a perfect scenario, getting assigned and having your break-even point be below where the stock is trading. So there's the four outrights, some discussion on volatility and theta and option pricing. The options education program has a whole lot for you. My path is an assessment test that lets you evaluate where you stand uh, in your options um, education and will recommend courses and videos and podcasts for you. And please reach out to us uh, after visiting the optionseducation.org website. Uh, reach out to us by email, options at the OCC.com. We'll be glad to help you out. We have a very robust YouTube channel as well and Facebook and Twitter, very popular and growing use of both of those by OIC. And again, please take that survey. Uh, we really value your feedback, and we will take that into consideration with all future decisions that we make.